Mission has been a core value of this church from the beginning. As we look at, again, the nations, the needs are endless, right, Bob? The needs are endless. And one of our chief stewardships at this church is to say, okay, Lord, out of the needs that you've presented our way, how do we best steward those needs and the finances that we receive here? And really one of the main tests that Bob and I have looked at throughout the years if we pray concerning this is, is what's the specific need and is there a sustainable solution? Because oftentimes we'll tend to put money towards things that really don't have a plan in place to actually meet the need that they're trying to solve. So we receive requests quite often. We get emails, we get phone calls. But in 2009, we received probably the most disturbing email we've ever seen uh, coming through our missions thread. And our missions director at the time said, I, I just received this notice from some missionaries in Ethiopia and I, I don't know what to do with this. So at the time as elders, we began to read this and it turns out that there's these specific YWAM missionaries that one day are in Ethiopia and they're going to the different tribes and they're sharing the gospel and they come across this tribe called the Kara tribe. And as they're there, they are performing a ceremony in which they're going to sacrifice nine children to their God in the Elmo River. And as they're there, they say, so why are you doing this? They say, well, these children, they're cursed. They said, in what way? And as they begin to build relationship with this tribe, they learned that if a child's top teeth come in before their bottom teeth, they're considered mingi, which means cursed by the gods. Secondly, if you as a husband and wife, get pregnant without the elder's permission, your child is considered mingi. So in the time of drought, you will then sacrifice these children to appease the gods that rain might come. As they're there, they said, listen, we understand that you believe these children are cursed, but our leader, our God, Jesus, took the curse upon himself. Therefore, we will take these curses off your hands. So these young missionaries in their early 20s take nine children into a hut and have no resources to care for them. We send our missionaries team out there. Sure enough, the story is true. It is real. And over the next year, they rescue 25 children from this tribe. Incredible story. It gets national attention, national geographic. We get to do stories on these things. However, we recognize and understand that that need just met in and of itself is not the true transformation that Jesus desires to bring to that tribe. So missionaries start to go in and these pastors get a heart. They say, you know what? We're going to start to serve these people. And as they're there and they're, they're meeting practical needs, they're bringing food and supplies, they establish this building that they begin to call a church. And they would meet and share the gospel. They would share the good news. Well, they got rumored that there was one man inside the village that at times would become uncontrollable. And he would try to take himself and others and to drown him and others in the Omo River. They said a spirit would overtake him, which was uncontrollable. Well, one day as they're holding one of these meetings, the man arrives and he begins to manifest these demons. But as they're there, these pastors come and they say, be quiet in the name of Jesus, come out of him. The man is delivered and set free. Such a radical move happens, they then baptize him in the river in which he would try to drown himself, in which they sacrifice others in. This place that became the depths of hell becomes the place of restoration and transformation. That's what takes place. There's such a radical move that happens, you know, seeing this practice. And we have a quick picture here. This is called the Mingi Gate, if you see this. In their ceremonial practice, they would take these children and they would pass them through the Mingi Gate or the Gate of the Curse. And so from this, they then take a section of this gate and the elders go to these pastors and say this, we recognize that your God has power. And we want to see whose God will win. So they take a section of the Mingi gate, put it next to the church as a battle between the gods. Little did they know that power was not in a building. Little did they know that power was not in a place. It was in the people of God that he sent there to bring transformation to that village. See, I believe we have a perfect picture in this story of what Jesus was intending to stay in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He said this, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not, shall not prevail against it. 
See, he's designed his church to be the vehicle of change for a broken and dying generation. He's called us to be the transformation, the change agent, to see healing and restoration everywhere we go. Now, when Jesus gives this declaration, it was not in a synagogue. It was not in a simple village. It was in the center of darkness in that entire region. See, oftentimes when we see like logistics in the Gospels, they'll write down a note of where they were. Now, Matthew intentionally writes down he was in Caesarea Philippi. This was not just a small city like Roseville. This was the main occult center of the entire region. And at the center of this city was a place they called Pan's Grotto. Here's a picture of Pan's Grotto. It was also named the Gates of Hell. And at this place, you can see it still exists today. There's carvings where they would have idols that they would set up and make sacrifices. And here is the literal gates of hell in which they would take sacrifices and surrender them to the god Pan. And as this is the backdrop and his disciples declare that he is the Messiah, he says, behold, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, shall not prevail against it. See, for too long, the church has been on the defensive. God has always called his church to be on the offensive, to take ground and establish his kingdom. Now, often we hear this phrase, church, a certain image comes to mind. We think of this, a building. Again, church steeples are beautiful. They're fine. In modern church, when you hear the phrase, you think of this. Stage, lights, excitement, fire, smoke, sound. Bands, awesome. We have to ask the question, was this the church Jesus was referring to? Was this it? See, we really get lost in language in our Bibles. See, we, we are so American-centric and English-centric, we think the Bible was written in English. See, I appreciate that we all speak it. It's the universal language of the world right now. For now, it is. But here's what we have to understand. We are a mixture of multiple languages and cultures. Greek and Hebrew were pretty isolated. And so when we have the New Testament in Greek, and Jesus uses this term, church, it's actually the Greek word, ekklesia. And ekklesia had nothing to do with buildings. See, in Ecclesia, when you get down to its rawest form, and I've done exhaustive study, and you can go back to past messages, which are dense on this word. But from this, we find that the true raw meaning of Ecclesia that Jesus is referring to is this, a people with a shared belief, a community with a common identity. That's what Jesus is referring to. And actually, the honest, purest picture of this word is this, a shepherd with a sheep. When Jesus said that, that's what the disciples would have saw. See, an ecclesia has a leader with a common identity. They share this belief together. And if you do a word search in the New Testament, you actually won't find church too many times. But you'll see Jesus' description of his ecclesia. We find this, that a church, the ecclesia, is a shepherd in the sheep. The vine and the branches, the cornerstone and the living stone, the high priest and a kingdom of priests, the head and the body with many members, the bridegroom and the bride. And what we understand through Jesus' definition of church, of ecclesia, it's this, a living, breathing organism that carries his presence to restore the brokenness of humanity. That is the church that Jesus is referring to. And he chooses this church, his ecclesia, as the vehicle for his gospel. When you look in your Bible, you'll see this term gospel. You'll see good news or glad tidings. And oftentimes we get over familiar with words in Christianity and they lose their significance. And we say them not knowing what they really imply. And you see, good news as well, it's good news. You get a raise, that's good news. Your child gets good grace, that's good news. If you're a parent with young kids and you sleep through the night, that is good news. But this word good news, Greek word euangelion, literally means 
a messenger that's bringing news of victory or declaring victory in the time of war. And so when we look at this term that Paul's referring to in Romans 1.16, he's not ashamed of the gospel, the euangelion of God. It's the power of transformation. We notice this, that historically, a euangelion or a gospel was the message that a messenger would receive from a king that a war had been won. And they would take this gospel, deliver it to the cities that were first the kings, and then to the cities that they had now had ruling priority or authority over. And these messengers were referred to as evangelists. That's what we know historically. So when we think of the term gospel, we think of Paul's definition in 1 Corinthians 15, that it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But we have to ask the question, then what gospel did Jesus preach before the cross? Because it says he came and he taught the gospel of the kingdom. And what we notice is that historical belief of the Jews is that the Messiah would come and set captives free. That was the gospel that he would bring as a message. And the clearest snapshot of this gospel of Jesus that we have is in Luke chapter 4. He enters a small town of Nazareth. As he enters the synagogue, he opens the scroll and he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news, euangelion, to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. This is the gospel of Jesus. He then sits down and says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. In a roundabout way, he says, I'm the guy and I'm going to bring this to pass. And shortly after, what do we notice? The very next phrase is here. He enters homes and begins to heal the sick, set captives free, and those that are demonized are rescued and set free. See, we live in an illusion in this culture that we don't have a real enemy. <laughs> have you noticed that? One of the greatest tactics of an enemy is to convince you they don't exist. And I think the church has lost sight that there's a real spiritual war at hand. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There's a real enemy. And let me just tell you, he doesn't want you to live your best life now. He has the worst intentions for you. You are in a fight. And we have to ask these questions. When things get weird, when they get strange with people, there might be some other forces at hand. But it's often in those rude awakenings, those hard moments that we learn to call on the power greater than ourselves. And his name is Jesus. And one of those radical moments of this, when I was a high school pastor, youth pastoring, my goodness, that is a gift in everybody's life. I don't wish that on my worst enemy. Just to, be, just to be honest with you, Ryan Vote, I love you to death. But my goodness. Youth pastoring is one of the challenging, most challenging years of my life, but I loved it. There was redemptive joy inside of it. But you often get these calls from parents that you would never anticipate getting. Your, their crisis is always your crisis in the life of a teenager, right? So I get a call from a mom one day. She says, Pastor Brandon, please help me. I said, what's going on? My kid says he doesn't want to go to church, and I think he doesn't believe in God anymore. I said, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. And his best friend is now saying the same things. I said, listen, I'll come over to your house. I'll take him out. We'll have a conversation. Let's go over to their house, knock on the door. They run outside into the car. And man, these kids are juiced, amped, and ready to go do something crazy. Get in the car. I said, where do you guys want to go? Taco Bell. Take us to Taco Bell. That is the Mecca of youth pastoring, by the way. So I said, okay, we'll go to Taco Bell, and we'll probably go to Sunsplash. That's also what you do, and we could talk. Get into Taco Bell, walk in. They run up. They make this crazy big order. So that's fine. As soon as the order is placed and I'm paying, they run over to the soda fountain, and they literally put their mouths up to the fountain and start sucking on it and start saying, suicide, and shaking it in their mouth. I said, sit down now. Get away from the soda fountain. I'm so mad at these kids. They sit down, we're waiting for their food. 
Food order comes. They said, hey, I'm going to use the restroom. Bring them the food. I come back. They have eaten everything. Everything is gone. What are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? I was like, oh, my goodness. Okay, we're going to go to Sunsplash. Go to Sunsplash. I get there, and I have $20. Put the $20 in, get our coins, give it to them. This kid goes to the most expensive game in the entire arcade and puts every quarter in and is done in five minutes. Oh, I'm done. So you guys want to act like children? We're going to do what children do. We're going to the park. And these kids who are over at Royer are running around contemplating many things. <laughs> and all of a sudden this guy drives by on his bike. And I just get that sense. It's time to go. I say, hey, guys, time to leave right now. Why? I was like, get in my car now. And he says, hey, you. I said, just keep walking. No, he's like, no, I think he's calling us. I said, you keep walking. <laughs> hey, you. You guys Christians? Yes, sir. Yes, we are. This kid says, I was like, shut your mouth. <laughs> the guy comes over. He says, Christians, huh? I was a Christian. Until God kicked me in the mouth. And he begins to proceed to tell us how he smuggled drugs over the Mexican border in which God abducted his drugs with the cartel. These kids are about to pee themselves. They're so scared. He says, okay, sir, thank you so much, sir. He said, hey, hey, wait. We didn't pray. <laughs> These kids. <laughs> so he's like, I was like, okay, let's pray. He's like, grab, our, grab my hand. And these kids are scared to death. You know who they are. I'll tell you afterwards, Mike. <laughs> so they grab their hands. And I said, Lord, bless this man. Bless this time. Thank you for so much for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. He's like, no, wait. You pray. He points to this kid. Oh, dear God, please save us. Please help us and protect us. <laughs> and he says, you pray. And these kids just scream and they cry. He's like, you forgot to pray for the children. And I said, Lord, bless the children. Amen. He goes, amen, right? Walks away. I'm so mad at these kids. They get in the car and they say, Pastor Brandon, please forgive us. We believe in God now. We believe in God now. We, we promise we do. We promise we need Jesus. When you encounter a power greater than yourself, you will call on a power greater than what you experienced. They had a radical encounter with God. I pray that the church has a radical encounter with the Lord. Because there's these moments of awakening when you don't know, because that enemy is prowling around. And Jesus goes house to house and is setting captives free. But this authority, this power, doesn't just stay with Jesus. He transfers it over to his disciples. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And he called to him 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, heal every disease and every affliction. See, the gates of hell now start to shake through these men and women that he's called to follow him. There's power and authority that is taking place. And they report back in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. The 72 said, and returned with joy. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In which Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall harm you. You have been given authority, church, to help set captives free. I don't want you to walk away from this message thing. This is just about the demonic realm. You are called to encourage and give hope to those that are lost and brokenhearted. And what happens is we overcomplicate this. We get so nervous and there's this pressure to share the gospel all the time. It's easier than you think it is. See, Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. See, we need to shift our thinking in our current mindset as church is it's hard to reach the lost to know that Jesus says the harvest is always ready and ripe. You just have to know which tree to pick from. You ever try to pick fruit from a tree that's not ready? Fruit's bad. Fruit's bitter. It's not helpful. You have to wait till the fruit is ready and ripe. And he gives us this simple strategy in Luke 10. He says, listen, it's easy. 
Look for the person of peace. And the person that opens their door to you, that's the one you spend time with. We spend way too much time and try to convincing people of the love of Jesus when they're not ready to hear it yet. And so I saw this just practically in my own life. I would go on runs in different neighborhoods and would just wait for God to open up opportunities. And, you know, I love Roseville. I love where we live, but I grew up in the hood. Anybody else with me? Gunshots and helicopters were a regular part of my life. And in one neighborhood I lived in that was not safe, I was 19 years old. I would go on runs around my neighborhood. Gangs were everywhere, but there was this one apartment complex I would run by. And one day as I'm running, I see this woman in a wheelchair and she looked younger. I said, oh no, what happened? Did you, did you get an injury? She said, oh no, it's not mine. This is my father's. I said, oh, what's up with your dad? Oh, he just had surgery today. He had his leg amputated. It turns out this man has rheumatoid arthritis and his left leg was amputated. I said, is he okay? He's like, no, he just got home from the hospital right now. I said, hey, uh, I'm a Christian. I would love to pray with him if he's open to it. And he's, she said, let me ask. Walks in, get in there. She said, yeah, my dad said, come on in. And there is the sweetest man I've ever met in my life. 66 years old, his name is Anderson. He says, how are you doing, sir? I heard you want to pray with me. I love your prayers. So we're there and I grab his hand and, and he's so crippled, his hands are literally deformed. And I begin to pray with Anderson. And I said, hey, would it be okay if I come back and visit you and just pray with you? He said, you come back once a week and pray with me. I just want to pray and believe that Jesus will heal me. I said, okay. So once a week, I would come by and visit Anderson. Knock on the door. His daughter was now there living with him to assist. As I would knock on the door, come in one day, Anderson has his head low. I said, Anderson, what's going on? He says, not good. So what happened? He said, they're going to amputate my other leg. I said, oh, what do we need to do? He said, God needs to heal me. I need to get healed. So I look and his right leg is swollen like a balloon. So I said, okay, Jesus, would you just come now and heal Anderson's leg? And before our eyes, we watch his knee shrink in size. And as the swelling is going down, I'm freaking out. I was like, Anderson, you seeing this? He's like, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it. He's there and his knee shrinks down. I said, the swelling's gone. He says, that's not it. And he starts moving his leg. He says, my kneecap was twisted. It's now straight. And he's there. I'm like, come on, no amputation needed. And so we were having this relationship built, but his, his daughter's in some serious darkness. And one day I knock on the door and Marsha opens the door. I say, is Anderson here? No, he's at the doctor's. I said, you okay? He said, no, I'm not good. I said, what happened? Lost my job. I said, okay, you all right? She said, no. No, I said, you want me to come in? She said, no. Shuts the door. I'm walking back to my house and uh, just hear the Lord say, give her everything you have. Here's the deal college student, working part-time, and I'm a youth pastor. I'm rolling in the dough, friends. <laughs> I have $20 to my name, literally. I'm living with my parents. And I go in there, and you know when, when God asks you to do something, you start putting conditions on the gift? I'm like, she better use this for food. She better. <laughs> so I put it in this envelope. Knock on the door. I said, hey, Marsha, you know, I was just praying and God told me to give you this. She said, what's this? I said, it's just, just some money. She opens it up, bursts into tears. She said, oh my God, oh my God, thank you so much. Come on in. As I come on in, on the couch is her friend Lisa. I've met Lisa a couple times and her knee is propped up. I said, Lisa, what's wrong? She says, I tore my ACL. I fell off the curb. I don't have medical insurance. I don't know what to do. Well, in the corner is her son, who's the shot caller of the bloods in the whole area. And he is mad dogging me. I say, hey, Lisa, you know, I pray for Anderson. Can I pray for you? She's like, what does that mean? Said, Real simple. Just pray right now. Pray for God to heal your knee. She's like, you're going to do any of that weird stuff? <laughs> I said, probably. No, I didn't say that. I said, no, it's real simple. Just grab my hand. So we pray. I say, why don't we check it out? She gets up. Power of the Lord hits Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Knee is completely healed. Freaks out. Her son sees it. Gets up, right? <laughs> I'm like, whoa, it's okay. And she says, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I said, Jesus has come not to heal your body, but to heal your heart. 
And as we're there and she's giving her life to Jesus, she's confessing everything she's ever done in a radical way. And we break off the pill addiction, the pain addiction that she has. That whole household gets saved. We look for the door that Jesus opens up to us. And you don't have to strive. You don't have to work. We just have to pray. I'm nothing special. Trust me. Ask my kids. <laughs> it is a simple authority we walk with in Jesus to set captives free. But there is a condition on this authority. Something we lose sight of. You know, everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I get it. But we're not called just to be converts. He's called us to be disciples. And see, there's conditions on discipleship. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the world and yet forfeits his soul? See, there was a radical call of discipleship that Jesus made, and this term, very simple, meant to follow someone's teaching. It's the term learner. And there's this illusion in Christianity that discipleship is a class. Did you give your life to Jesus? Have you done our discipleship class? Have you taken the class and taken the test? Did you memorize the verses? He doesn't know the verses. Did you get the verses? I will stop there. I will say things that I can't take back. <laughs> Discipleship is a lifelong process until you go meet Jesus as a throne. You don't stop, friends. The moment you say you stop learning, you stop living. It's over. It's time to re-engage with the call of discipleship. And the excuses have to end. Right after he says this, he gives this mandate and this call. And everybody wants to follow him. Luke 9, 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. See, the call of discipleship, you have to learn to surrender your convenience. It is never a convenient call. It is never up to your terms. It's never up to your conditions. See, Jesus' life was a hard-lived life, but it had a greatest joy that no one could buy. It's a life in the Spirit. As he continues on, verse 59, another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, one of the harshest statements in all the Gospels, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. We see this, and I've read so many commentaries that try to wiggle Jesus out of what he said. <laughs> Here's another, this is a different culture. What we don't know, and I'll, I'll have the site reference here, and you can find this notes online. I've done a lot of study on this. See, he wasn't telling this disciple to skip his dad's funeral. See, in that culture at that time, there were two burials. There was the first ceremony in which they were in the tomb, and then a year later, they would then take the bones and have a second burial. During this year of process, they were sorting out the inheritance of the land. So this son is saying, hey, this is my inheritance. I want to sort this out. And really what he's telling Jesus is, hey, after I get my retirement set up, hit me up on Instagram. I'll come and visit you. Hey, hey, get in my DMs, slip in my DMs, and, and then maybe I'll meet up with you and your other disciples. Jesus says, listen, that's a dead man talking. Let the dead bury their dead. This was a call of radical discipleship. And let me tell you, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, it means you have to surrender your comfort. You have to let it go. Last thing he says is this, verse 61. He says, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at home. And Jesus said, 
No one, thank you for that background music. That's, that was perfect. I felt that. That's like, shout to the Lord, right, Ben? There we go. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Final call of discipleship is you have to surrender control. Any recovering control freaks in the house? Those that love their to-do list, their organization. You love to tell Jesus how it's going to be? See, our call to discipleship is a full call of surrender. See, I was one of those that grew up. Man, that background music with this story. Woo, that's fire. I grew up in the church world. It doesn't mean you know Jesus. I had that genuine moment when I was eight. The car ride. That's good. It's all right, Carrie. Lord, heal that stand, Lord. Put that stand. Back to the moment, all right? Eight years old, make this commitment to Jesus in my car with my mom. It was genuine. But we went through lots of church transitions. Lots of broken churches and church plants and I was in high school, we were part of a church plant and we were all excited for our youth ministry to get started and we had this meeting in our house and the youth pastor was there and we were excited. And then a week later we got noticed that the youth pastor quit. <laughs> That's the last youth meeting we had. I'm freshman year in high school, don't know what to do, just trying to fit in. And I put God on the back shelf. Christianity was no longer a part of my life Monday through Saturday, except for Sunday. And as I was there, I became one of those chameleons. I said what everybody would say. I was quick-witted and make fun of other people, just trying to fit in. But junior year, I was a starter on the, on the, on the football team, Del Campo High School. And as we're there, you know, we had the chance to go to the playoffs and the championship. We were a real prominent team. But I hear this small voice of God say, you need to quit. You're going to lose yourself if you continue this way. So as I'm there, I'm contemplating this. I don't know what to do. And I come up with this plan. I say, you know what? If I quit, I'll lose all my friends. But if I fake an injury. So one day we're in practice, we're hitting the bags. bags. I'm there and I, this is my moment, right? And I hit the bag and I go, ah, oh, and I fall down on my shoulder. They say, get up, Naramore. I'm like, I can't, I can't. Say he's hurt. He's hurt. Get over there, and there's my shoulder. I'm holding it all tight. I'm like, call his dad to take him to the doctor. My dad comes, and I'm like, I just did my moment, you know, greatest acting job on the planet. But now they're taking me to a doctor. And now I get nervous. And now I go in for an MRI, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Doctor comes back. I think I'm found out. He says, looks like you have a small tear in your rotator cuff and you won't be able to play football this season. And I'm like, no, it's horrible. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I come to school in this clean, in this sling. Here's the funny thing. My parents don't know, right? So I'm in this sling for 12 weeks and my shoulder gets so sore, I would have to go to the bathroom and take it off to stretch my shoulder out. Well, in the process... I end up losing all my friends anyway. It just happens. And so I'm hanging out with those. Man, dude, I'm feeling this today. I'm hanging out with all my friends, you know, those that have quit, past quitters, right? And this girl in my economics class was a goth the year before. Remember all the makeup and all the spikes and everything? Now comes in clear-eyed. And she starts preaching to me. She says, you need to give your life to Jesus. And she says, I said, no, you don't understand. I'm a Christian. She said, you ain't no Christian. You got to come to my church. So she invites me to this little youth group called Rock Roseville. 17 years old. And I'm there, meet Pastor Mark and all the others. And I'm starting to live this life of seeming transformation. But yet that wasn't who I was at school. And the day comes when I'm in my English class. And they're making fun of my friend, Nikki Reif. And as they're making fun of Nikki, I stand up and say, don't make fun of her. I'm a Christian too. And this guy, Andrew, stands up and says, you ain't a Christian. You're a pervert. 
and everybody laughs in my class. And that's when conviction hits. And I go home that day, and like everybody does, if you've grown up at church, I read the entire book of Romans on my little futon in my room and gave my life to Jesus and never looked back. See, if you think you can control your image, you can control your life, you can control your kids, or your spouse, or your family, you're missing what Jesus has called us to live. And that's a surrendered life to him. Let's stand together as we pray. Uh, I'm not going to have the prayer team come forward yet, okay? So prayer team, we're going to do a little different today. They'll come and pray for people. Let's just close our eyes. I want us to really make a call. Again, I know we're a little over time, children's ministry. Let's be respectful of them in a minute. But just let's surrender our hearts to the Lord. And I'm going to ask you to lay some things on the altar. So Jesus, we come today as your church, as your ecclesia. Lord, we pray that we would follow our shepherd. We pray that we would hear his voice. And Lord, today, as you've called us to be messengers of the gospel, that we would be faithful disciples of Jesus. And you're here today, and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus fully. You've never said, I will follow you no matter what. If that's you, lift your hand up right now. Jesus, we pray for brothers and sisters as they would contemplate what it means to give their life to you, that Jesus, a full surrender would take place. That God, you would do your work. You would have your will. You would have your way. Second thing is this. You've been in a place, you say, you know what? It's time for me to surrender control. You've made all the plans. You've made all the decisions. If that's you, lift your hand up right now. Holy Spirit, we pray that a true surrender would take place. Just again, want to make that call. This is not just strictly giving your life to Jesus. This is a discipleship commitment. Surrendering control. Just come down to the front. We want to pray for you. This is one of those moments. We want to empower you with prayer. You say, you know what? I identify there is control in my life that I've not given over to Jesus. Just come down right now. We're going to pray for you. All the way forward. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thanks, let's make some room here. All the way down. Jesus, we make this response to you. Lord, we pray today for a radical surrender. Oh, wait, don't worry. This is a moment between you and the Lord. Let's make some, some room here, friends. See, so you know what? There's some control I need to surrender. There's some things I've been holding on to, some decisions I've delayed. This is your moment. We'll wait. Prayer team, let's come down and just lay hands on some people. Holy Spirit, we thank you that we are called to be disciples of you. We're called to be those that would follow without hesitation. Prayer team, let's lay hands on those that have come down. God, we pray for a move of your spirit. It would be significant. Lord, as we receive this call of discipleship, of kingdom, that we would see your church walk in power. Lord, we pray that you would deliver those from anxiety right now in Jesus' name. Just eyes closed around the room. You've been dealing with an unusual amount of anxiety and nervousness. Just lift your hand up. No one's looking at you. Father, we say deliverance in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name. There's people here that have been dealing with insomnia. Wave your hand at me. Father, we just declare perfect peace that those that are called in your name would lie down and sleep in peace. For you, O Lord, let us dwell at sleep in safety. God, we pray for those right now that have been dealing. I, I feel like a gastrointestinal issue. You've been dealing with some, some unusual stomach pain, digestive enzyme issues. That's you. Wave your hand at me. Father, we declare healing. The gastrointestinal tract all the way throughout the stomach. Ulcerative colitis, we command healing in Jesus' name. That God, you would do your work and have your way. Thank you, Holy Spirit.